I think that he's doing this to praise God, but I think he's also doing it because he knows his son needs this example. That he needs this encouragement and he needs to be reminded on the day of his coronation where everybody's focused on him that really everyone should be focused on God and what God has done for this country. I think that it, it really does show that David was a caring father and he most wanted his children to follow in his footsteps, not for the increase of David's own fame and glory, but because of the glory of God. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. The Chaplain's Report today, we are actually going to be looking at David, but not in the series that we were going through in 1 Samuel. So we're going to be jumping to a different book with a different story that's not contained within 1 Samuel because it's a little bit later in David's life. But since I was thinking about what we should be doing for Thanksgiving and, and what are some ways to be grateful, what are some good Bible stories that sort of emphasize this, there's an episode where First Chronicles actually records the coronation of King Solomon. You may recall King Solomon is one of David's sons, and he is the one whom he chose to be king over his other children. And so because of this, they have a coronation, and this is actually the second coronation of King Solomon. So let's go ahead and look at First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 19, which reads, So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on earth, yours is the dominion, Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over it all. Both riches and honor come for you, come from you, and you rule over all. And in your hand is the power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you, and from your hand we have given to you. For we are strangers before you and temporary residents, as our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. Our Lord God, all this abundance that we have provided to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand, and everything is yours. Since I know, my God, that you put the heart to the test and delight in, right, in uprightness, I, in the integrity of my heart, have willingly offered all these things. So now, with joy, I have seen your people, you who are present here, make their offerings willingly to you. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intentions of the hearts of your people and direct their hearts to you and give, up, and give my son Solomon a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes and to do them all and to build the temple for which I have made provision. So an important part of that, that that may help you understand is that this is Solomon's coronation, the second one that he's been through. But it's also a dedication of the building materials for the temple. Because remember, before this time in Israel's history, there was no temple. You worshipped in the tabernacle, which was a tent. It wasn't a solid building. It wasn't made out of wood. It was made out of canvas and cloth and gold and a few other ornaments. But basically, it was just a really big tent. Now they're actually going to build a house, which David had desired to do, but the Lord told him, no, you're not allowed to do that. You can make provision for it, but your son Solomon is going to be the one that actually builds the temple. And so David is here kind of pouring his heart out in this prayer 
thanking God for the fact that he has the ability and has been given the blessings in Israel to be able to acquire all these building materials and that his son is going to be the one that gets to erect the temple to God. And remember that this thing is one of the seven wonders of the world. There are royalty and dignitaries that came to this little bitty nation of Israel just to see the temple. We actually have record of this other in other places in the Old Testament. And so it is really an incredible blessing that has been bestowed upon Israel and to be a light to the rest of the nations. And you hear there, King David is kind of like, and who are my people that we get to be the ones to do this? Like he is just humbled and really taken aback at the fact that God cares about them enough and loves them enough to say, this little bitty people in this little nation here, you guys are going get, to get to be the ones to build my temple and to be my example to the other nations. But did you notice through all of that, there's this spirit of gratitude and humility and understanding that David didn't get where he is and didn't acquire it because of his own greatness? He says over and over again, Lord, all these things are yours. You're the one that has the ability to do that. I give you the credit. Yes, these things have been gathered by me, but you're the one that gave them to me in the first place. I've just been the one to kind of bring them all together. And ultimately, this is all you anyway, and you gave me the ability even to do that. And so I think since we're talking about gratitude here, this is kind of David's Thanksgiving Day proclamation. And part of the reasons I picked this verse and, and picked this passage is because it reminded me a lot of what we started out the day with. You remember in reading Dwight D. Eisenhower's Thanksgiving Day proclamation that you see kind of the same sentiment there, that he's saying God is the cause, he's the reason for all of this, and because he has given us these things, we have a responsibility to use them to do his will. David is saying, I've amassed all this strength and greatness, and I have an army that is, is really powerful, and I have all these wonderful things, and you've given me the ability to even pass these things down to my son. But help me always remember, Lord, that they came from you and that I have an obligation to you to use those blessings in a way that would bring your will about. That's exactly what David is doing here in building the temple. In fact, there's even a passage earlier on. It's the one where David first sort of comes up with the idea of building a temple for God. He actually is sitting there and he goes, why is it that I get to live in this nice palace and, and we're still worshiping God in a tent? He literally feels guilty that he's been given all these wonderful things from God and that he feels like he hasn't really done his part to adequately give back and, and provide a similar or even greater house for God. And God's response, of course, to that is, and I find it really humorous, God's like, did I ever ask you for a house? I almost like, yeah, I don't really need one, but if you want to give me one, sure. And this dedication of that temple this coronation of a king, I think that that's significant because ultimately David is giving, through a lot of humility and understanding that he has an obligation to use the gifts God's given him in a way that benefits all of mankind and his country, he understands the use of that power just like Dwight D. Eisenhower did. And more importantly, I don't think that it's insignificant that this is part of his son's coronation. You notice that he didn't talk a whole lot about Solomon until the very end in the last few verses there. Why? Because Solomon is not at center stage, and David gets that. David understands that the blessings that he's been given, including the ability to coronate his son over this country, is ultimately something that comes from God, and it's something that needs to be used to bring God's glory about. See, God's on center stage in David's heart, not Solomon. This is a good day for Solomon. He's very proud of Solomon and the ability that he has the ability to do this, but ultimately he realizes that God is what's important here. And I think what is going on is, I'm, I'm not saying that it's insincere, because I, I believe that this is 100% sincere, but I also think there is an aspect of this that we might be overlooking when it comes to David. And that is, I think that he's doing what a lot of dads do, in the sense that, He's modeling something for his son. I think that's really the purpose of all this. That David, because he wants his son to be a godly man and a godly king, that he's looking at this and going, I need to make it clear to my son that 
everything that he has, all the glory he's going to experience, all of the riches and power that I'm passing down to him, you don't use that for your own selfish desires. And unfortunately, Solomon did in many occasions. But he says, that's not the purpose of this. You have these things because you are a steward of God. You have been given these things to bring about his will. And the most important thing that you can do as I'm making you king is not to establish a name or a household for myself or continue our lineage or any of those other things that most earthly kings would have emphasized. The most important thing you can do is make sure that these provisions that I've made for you to build God's house, that needs to get done. God should be at the forefront of everything you do as king, and he's modeling that out in front of his son and making sure his son realizes, look, your accomplishments as king, they don't come from you. They come from God, and you need to give him the glory for that. I mean, I don't know about you, but my dad did stuff like this all the time. Not exactly like this, obviously, but it was not uncommon for my own father to try to emphasize certain things when he was teaching me a lesson about making sure that, that God is recognized in all of that. And there were certain times where he would be, for example, in front of the congregation, where he would be preaching or leading a prayer or doing Lord's table, where I'm not saying that he wasn't motivated by other things or that it wasn't good for the whole congregation, but it was really more aimed at me. And I think that's what David is doing here is he's praying and he's kind of doing a sermon and a lesson in conjunction with his prayer. I think that he's doing this to praise God, but I think he's also doing it because he knows his son needs this example. That he needs this encouragement and he needs to be reminded on the day of his coronation where everybody's focused on him. That really everyone should be focused on God and what God has done for this country. I think that it, it really does show that David was a caring father and he most wanted his children to follow in his footsteps, not for the increase of David's own fame and glory, but because of the glory of God. And I think David knows that the ultimate act of thankfulness is faithfulness. That The correct response to gratitude is to behave in a way that reflects that of a grateful person. It's easy to say thank you. It is. Anybody can say thank you. Whether they mean it or not, they can be lying about it. But if you really want someone to feel gratitude, you have to behave in a grateful manner. I don't know how many times where when I had disappointed my parents, the reaction was something to the effect of, you know, do I not clothe you and take care of you and provide for you and all those things. Now, on the surface level, speaking from a strictly logical perspective, that sounds kind of weird and goofy and almost like they're trying to, to get some kind of praise or adoration out of it. But that's not what's actually going on. And I think those of you that have kids probably understand this. It's not trying to subjugate your kids. It's trying to make them think about, okay, I have been given all these things from my parents. And they do all these things for me. And all they're asking is for me to, you know, clean my room or cut the grass or whatever else it is. Why don't I do that? Because a grateful person that really appreciates the things that have been done for him would want to do those things, would want to listen to their parents. Well, how much more true of that, uh, true is that for our Heavenly Father, who has given us literally everything, including the gift of life? How many times has God looked down on us and seen us groan because we, you know, have to get up early to go to church or go out and, and help poor people or, or whatever with some kind of charity work that we're doing? And we kind of grumble about it and we don't have a great attitude. And God's just sitting up there going, have I not given you literally everything? Have I not given you the means to help these people? Have I not blessed you with these things so that you may do my will? I think understanding that and having a true gratitude for the things that God has given us is going to make us more faithful. Because ultimately, gratefulness is the antithesis of pride, which I would argue is the deadliest of all sins. And so if we really want to be people that follow God, we can't just be ungrateful kids that go around and thinking we deserve everything or we're entitled to the things that we've been given. We ultimately have to obey because that's better than affection or lip service. That's better than just saying thank you to God for everything rather than actually behaving in a manner that shows that we have, we have gratitude. 
This is a responsibility that we have with the blessings that God has given to us. And I would ask that all of us remember that when we're celebrating the National Day of Prayer and Thanksgiving tomorrow. Stay the course, friends. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me. I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.